And I love your pins that you're wearing. Can you tell me about your pins, first of all, as is? As is? Well, I've written a poem about being 60, and I've written a poem about being 80, and I thought, well, okay, as is. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one... You had another, you had yeah. another pin, yes. The other one here says, be patient with me, I'm intuitive. Which <laughs> <laughs> is more than true. <laughs> Well, I find it very easy to be patient with you because you have so many interesting, um, I just, every time I'm with you, I kind of learn more about things that you're doing, and I just find it very interesting um, looking at all the different variety that you're doing. Well, the two of you are very inspiring to me, too, and one of the ways is because I'm so all over the map with the things that I do, how could it be possible to put a show together and you did it? Well, we did it, yes, yeah. thanks to you also. All three of us, yeah. I love the way we put on the show and then we need to take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way that slow down, okay, stop. Yeah, every now and then have to take a nap, very important. Yeah. Naps are extremely important. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, how, you know, looking at all of this work here, it's, it's all so different. What, what do you think of about how we see lots of different kinds of art, and then you have poetry, and that's kind of like art also. What do you feel about seeing all the variety of things, like a kind of, um, it's also kind of a poetry, isn't it? Yeah, I, I sort of don't do labels very much. Um, some of the poems turned out to be concrete poems. Um, what does that mean? Uh, it means making, making the shape of the words on the page look like what you're writing about, like the glass of water. Looks like a glass of water. Yeah. And then Rupa having a piece of that ending part reminds me. Can you talk a little bit about this, this thing that's going around the whole gallery here? This is 110 feet of your event scores. And event score, can you say a little bit about what event scores well, are Well, they're first? not all event scores. It's just stuff that occurred to me as in the 60s and 70s mostly. Some of it's newer. But um, events were like small happenings, and happenings were like, I don't know, hell. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, yeah. what, what would you say about happenings? Uh, Sort of another develop, development of art. Well, sure, but, but um, <clears throat> unrehearsed theater, I guess you might you might say. Yeah, though and, and the theater often had a score to it that struck you. Yeah, but from which you could uh, make variations as you went along. But an event is a much smaller, more uh, circumscribed kind of kind of thing, like. Um, this is an event which probably will not ever happen, but it says dilute the, and then it says name your river with water. So dilute the Connecticut River with water. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what's the that, point of that? That would be an event. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe I'm not Very pointed political. I First of all, it's <laughs> funny. And second of all, it's about a very serious situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's highly appropriate to be humorous about things, uh, whether they're funny things or not. And a lot of people think that humor means trivial, and I don't agree with that. You want to add something about like your 
Aspen, you're, you're working with socially engaged art with your students at Putney. Yeah, with 16 to 18 year olds. Wow. One who's 19. Whew. Yeah. So beginning to introduce those ideas to kids who've never seen it before and have only ever made art um, with either predetermined content or at least with predetermined medium. Uh -huh. So where they sit down and they know they're going to be making a painting. Uh -huh. How do you, how would you go about teaching a child to think abstractly or think an idea-based way and then determine medium secondarily. Oh, good heavens. I, I only <laughs> raised two kids. I don't, <laughs> I don't feel as though I'm an expert. Well, what's the, um, so what is the gap sort of between, say, a person who's been making art, regardless of their age, yeah. um, in a medium-based way and the way that you approach art? Bracken, would you like to? Uh, contribute to that? Sure. I mean, as, as kids growing up in the sort of performance world and avant-garde art movement in New York, there was, I mean, it was, I think it actually, teaching adults is harder than teaching kids. There's a sort of, it's about play and it's about structuring meaning and it's about taking your experience and translating it into actions that have some kind of resonance. And uh, I think a, a big, the hard part of it is giving enough freedom mm -hmm. um, to, and to sort of trust uh, the, the importance of your own perception and the, and the value of your own voice. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's one of the things that's really quite lovely in, in this whole body of work is it's, it, it just, it, it simplifies things down to these very, um, direct and precise kinds of pieces of communication. I wrote a poem about Bracken when he was two, and it was, um, if I walked down, if I walked down the street as completely as my two-year-old son, I would never get to the end of the block. <laughs> and oh, I like that. I find that that kind of is the way I walk through life. I keep picking stuff up and looking at it and thinking about it. And um, there's a lot of little sculptures made of bones, and they came from my oxtail soup bowl. And uh, they started looking like creatures, and then I would fiddle with them and on my plate, and a story would emerge. And they're all very different stories, and um, so I, I guess that's kind of what my process is like. You know, I, I think that your whole thing of teaching students is something about getting them to think outside the box. If you, if you think that most art, when people express something, a lot of ways of working is to start with an idea. You have a subject and you want to express it in a painting. So you take that same subject and you'd say, how would you translate this subject with objects, right? How would you translate this subject with words? How would you translate the subject with an action or a movement? You know, that's how dancers. And there's a lot of ways to cross-pollinate that. You start an idea and you have certain objects that represent the idea. Then you figure out what to do with the objects you have certain movements or actions or performative things that describe that. And that's one way of going through it. But it starts with something very simple and builds up. And then things happen, and then you branch off into other ideas. But it's just really the translation of an idea from one form rather than a painting or a sculpture that's often very literal into something that's more you know, I'm, I mean, I got to that whole thing of like thinking of ideas in that when I was in the 60s in elementary school when a teacher came in with a copy of Yoko Ono's Grapefruit. And I started reading these scores and I went like, wow, this is an idea, you know, make a hole in the sky. Mm -hmm. So I went around, I looked at this guy and said, oh my God, just the idea mm -hmm. just expanded the possibilities yeah. mm -hmm. of, of things like in such a creative way that it really opened up an amazing, amazing door and window for me. So years later, when I came to this whole Fluxus thing and understanding that, it was just kind of built that in a more concrete way because they had philosophies and ideas. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, but I think that the, I think that the actual, the ideas were very simple, but they became more developed in a philosophy as you started developing them. Yeah, they, uh, that reminds me that Yoko and I were, were working 
fair, well, not really closely together, but we were friends and we would discuss things from time to time. And the work that she was doing and the work that I was doing were very similar. I, I don't think that's answering your question. But, um, it, you weren't, yeah. It, but, I instantly thought of her stuff when I walked in here. Yeah. And there was another Fluxus artist named George Brecht, and he was very influential for me, too. And he, among others, were, um, was very interested in, in Zen, particularly, in Buddhism, but in Zen, particularly. And there's a lot of that in, in my work. So maybe, maybe that's an avenue into changing people's <coughs> way of looking things. I find that one of the most difficult things in showing my work to people is that it seems so strange to them because I've been in some other place in my mind, such as Zen, mm -hmm. um, other places too, but um, they haven't. And mm -hmm. so they want to know, well, what is this good for? or some kind of a question like that. And it isn't necessarily good for anything. It just is. <laughs> I mean, what am I good for? What are you good for? You know, it's just, you know, here we are. If you take the Cagean thing where it goes into sound, which John is Cage. Sound. John Cage, yeah. every, you know, and Brecht has a score where it's like pouring, you know, drip music, the sound of the drip. And you think of how, how, what kind of sounds you can make that don't use traditional musical instruments. You come up with a lot of things. You take that whole idea into art, you know, and you come up with a whole other area of things. And didn't, was it George Brecht who, I think he came up with the idea of event scores in John Cage's class, and then everybody Could was be. doing it. I read that somewhere. Right. Wow. So the idea of the event score as being a, an action happening, mm -hmm. just for those, we all seem to know what it is, but just in case people don't, but an event score being a something that you're doing or thinking about, and it's in the form of a score, like a musical score, except it's like an idea. Have I got right. that right? Yeah. yeah. Like there was sure. some British artist that won the Turner Prize, Mm -hmm. for doing this marvelous thing. One was taking a ball of paper and throwing it into the center of the room. And the other one was turning a light switch on and off. Which, which was a George, George Brecht score. Mm -hmm. turn switch on. <laughs> now you're thinking it's just, it's, it's not so much the motion, but something happens with a room when it's lit. Your brain does a certain thing and then it goes off, but your brain does a certain other thing. Mm -hmm. That's like an experience, right? Mm -hmm. And of all people, Roy Lichtenstein did a picture of a light switch. Right. And it said on, but if you turn it the other way around, it said no. I'm looking at the at the words, and it, there's a score. Go to a movie blindfolded, listen once through, sit through the through the movie again, eyes open, ears plugged. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an experience that you can actually do, or you can just think about it. You and it it just sort of takes an event like a movie and then gets you to think about it from a bunch of different angles and play with it. I was, can I just sort of flag the, there's a box in the center of the table called Language Box by the Black Thumb Press by Nye when her name was Beachy Hendricks. And uh, as you were talking about, sort of, if you could view it as a score, you could view it as a collection of poems, or you could view it as a single poem. It's, it's a, there's really not a clear direction, it's just a set of word pairs. Duplicity exchange. Jade Peak. <laughs> P-I-Q-U-E, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Killing modest. Roach whistling. So they're just evocative word pairs, or there may be ideas that you can play with. Storm still is a more obvious relationship there. Um, the sucker time. Time sucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to read them in the yeah. order in which they were arrived. Right, you could go book. through year, death, decade, deep sea, definition. 
Um, Deep Sea White. That's one of the pairs I remember. And you actually have thought a lot about the, the pairing of the some words. Of, some of them, <clears throat> I think the most, the most versions that one of them went through was 17. Wow. I kept um, rewriting. So they're sort of, high, they're as distilled as haiku or even more so, just yeah. down to yeah. a single well, word with another. Two words is the irreducible Set against each poem. other. <laughs> now, I remember one time you said you were, that, that you thought your friends would dis, were despairing of your revising things. But I, and I said, no, they're not despairing. It's like, let's see what's going to come next. Because mm. it's uh, like, I just thought that was interesting. Like, oh, no, I'm changing it again. <laughs> yes, let's see what the, what's going to happen now. Like, exploration. Like, mm. you know, I, it's just a phrase that I, that I used. The word work pairing, because I think Nice. The, the work that words do and the works of words and works about words and these, being a worker of things. words and yeah. yeah just do well that's one of your other pins the one that you didn't uh, mm -hmm. do you want to talk about that poem that's hanging on the back wall yeah a lot of a lot of my stuff has history maybe that's always true of writers I don't know but um, Hello. Okay. And we're okay. just in time. And release. More chairs, more chairs. More chairs, okay. Sorry, she was here when he was busy. Come on over here. We're having a discussion. Yeah, Clark is from BCTV, and we're just having an informal discussion about how it's work. Oh, okay. There's some people in the house. Thank you for coming. Feel free to come to us. Come join us. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Come over here. Let's see. Oh, the poem. Oh, the poem, right. Yeah. So I, I was saying that. Tell us what the poem says. Could you says. read it to us? Because I can't. Thank you. <laughs> um, Thank you. 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 If I can. Um, I wrote it actually about a month after the towers came down in 9 11. And we had just discovered that my brother in law, whom I loved very dearly, had mad cow disease and so there was a lot of stuff converging there and I can't quite see well enough to do it but are you glasses in the other room no glasses are oh, right are. here yeah, but, but, you're reading but, oh. yeah. Um, who can remember ice <coughs> I, I'm, I'm gonna have to get up sure Who can remember ice? Ice is the image in my mind of forgetting. The, this, yeah, at this point this will help. The, the image of broken shards, of jaggedness and sharp ends slicing. Who can remember ice? When the mind's heat comes to bear, it deliquesces and vanishes down the, down the crack at the center of the table into the earth. Remember ice? Ice is where memory stops memories, <coughs> where memory stops memory's action. As the mind slows to a crawl, it shines, it splinters into gleaming fragments. Remember, now, remember. As the mind slows, freezes, splinters, some new thing as lethal, fragile, strong, and terrible as ice is emerging.
Thank you. It's an amazing piece, even if you can't read it, because it, it looks like some Japanese mm -hmm. mysterious messages. You know? It also and looks like just, icicles. Then you can read it, and like icicles, too. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> just great. I, it caught my eye when I came in, and I just was quite taken with it. I am still. And it was a found stick. Mm. <laughs> Well, I was rather nervous when one lady that I know, um, who is a very churchy lady, came in, and I th and she's elderly, and I was just concerned that she would be horrified by all of this. But she happened to come in that door, and she's a a mushroom freak, mm -hmm. like, like myself, a mycologist, and. <laughs> So I showed her that shirt, which says Chandarelles on it, and she loved it. And I said, "That's that's for for the mushroom team." <laughs> <laughs> and from then on, she was open to everything else she saw, which was good luck. <laughs> Treat seeing your word work boxes there. <coughs> flowing yeah. along behind Did you. Did you get a, a good view of those? Yeah, I remember oh, when yeah. I <coughs> first uh, sort of hit upon the idea of seeing these. These would be something that would be in store windows, you know, advertising or whatever. Or in a bank telling yeah. what dividends they were giving. Yeah, yeah, all of that sort of thing. And so we tracked down where they came from, the mm -hmm. maker. And well, my first thought was, would a haiku go on there? Yeah, right. <laughs> and I was very pleased that I could get a haiku, and they're not all haikus. But I also, if I really squeezed, I could get a quatrain on there. There's a number of other tapes which are interchangeable. And um, where, where did you put it? Where, where did you put the box? Like, somewhere? Yeah, did, for displaying it, for showing it um, publicly? Yeah, they were in my first show in 1966, and have been shown other times, but they've been in storage more than not. <laughs> so it's very nice to see them out and working. And Jeff and Sir brought them up from New York. Which was nice. Thanks for getting them working again. Yeah. Bracken, wow. Bracken, Bracken did it. Thank you, Bracken. Wiggle for the pieces. The bottom one is stuck, but I think it's stuck very tantalizing. No, it's no, moving. It's moving. It's moving. It's moving. Bracken yeah. got it moving. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was stuck on the word whisper. I thought, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was good. That was okay. That's stuck the, on the quietest word one. It just says, wait, whisper, quiet. Shell. That's all it says. And I don't know why it says that. <laughs> it's just what came. It would be great to sneak it into some place. A savings and loan. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because they used to be in bank windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what I wanted to do, and it did happen later, but not with my work was to run it around the Allied Chemical Building in New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the people at the bank, or at the, at the building, were, were too afraid of, of artists at that point. The so they said no. But somebody else actually did bring it off with their work. Yeah. So you were a pioneer. As usual. <laughs> <laughs> And you did go through approaching them and trying to negotiate getting it. It was Tina somebody. Mandel that, that did it because she knew somebody there, and um, it just didn't didn't happen. Mm -hmm. but, so somewhere up there it says, "Run your poems around the Light Chemical Building in lights." Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's maybe this is a prototype for that. 
how you see words outside the box and have all kinds of very inventive ways of working with them. Yeah, I've never workers. been quite sure where the box is. <laughs> you do run into the, into the edges sometimes. Oh, I like this Come in, yeah. Come in. Come on in. No problem. Come on in. Hi, Amelia. Hi. Come on. Have a seat. Hello. We're all together just having a horrible chat. Do you see the work as subversive? I see the culture as subversive. <laughs> So the work is maybe pointing that out uh, to say that I saw it as subversive would be like admitting that there was something wrong with it, which I, I refuse to admit. So by culture, you mean the avant-garde movement? No, I mean the culture we live in. Uh, so you're saying you don't judge it? Did I say that? Sounds like it. You're saying maybe you judge the culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Not judging the art. Come on in. We're just having an informal discussion. And there's seats where you can sit. Come on in. All right. This is really, no, this is really informal. We're just having a discussion with the artists. You're quite welcome. Come on in. Have a seat. Thank you. No trouble at all. Yeah, we'll get more chairs. Have a seat. Adam, put the music on and we'll all have to run around and get as far as we can. See, that would be an event. Right. Yeah. There's something else that you want to share about your work, Well, an event is a small happening. A happening is a small show like a theater production mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> or it might not be so small. <laughs> no, but compared it might, to... It might be the eruption of Vesuvius. That would be quite a happening. That would be a very big yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in, in the contemporary world now, where everything is so overproduced, there's a kind of a really nice thing that all the objects that you're using are actually ready-mades or things that you yeah. find that sort of inspire it whereas you know there's a current contemporary art mode where you take that water bottle that's there it would mm. have to be bronzed so that you really knew that it was an art object and art and not just a and you know i like the kind of simplicity of that and the found nature of it because it sort of makes it sort of like because you recognize as an object you sort of pass it really easily and then when you come back to it starts twerking this other stuff, you're going, wait a minute, there's like, what's that well, doing there's, on it? Well, there's Marcel Duchamp. Yeah. And he brought <clears throat> a urinal into the museum to show, and also a bottle drying rack. Right. Which is mm -hmm. wonderful. And it was the fact of isolating it and giving it a place to be and a name that, um, that made it different from what it was manufactured and intended to be. Yeah, but you would take a bottle rack and you would hang something on it, for instance, that would make it not just the found object, but, the, you know, the rack engaging with whether it was a word or another prop or something else <laughs> animates the kind of thinking behind it. Because there's no, even, well, I guess the bones are sort of, themselves, but then they're arranged in a way where there's something else. It's the arrangement of them. I mean, it's a very conscious kind of manipulation of the found thing or an addition to it in a very subtle way. That, mm. yeah. But Duchamp's bottle rack is part of nice history, and so if you were to take that as kind of a given and then do some kind of twist and turn on it, not necessarily putting a bottle on it, but or turning it upside down or something, it would be like you referencing that 
but then going ahead and making your own kind of haiku of bringing that image together with another image seems to me. I'm not saying that this is a piece you necessarily do, but uh, you know, I think in a number of the pieces here, there is that juxtaposition of two kind of different worlds that reverberate in another way. You know what? Just yep. your hand motions oh. as you were talking suggested to me a movie strip, <laughs> which yep. is well, oh. we did a reading. Uh, yeah. at a cafe in, in New York one one time and the script was um, it was a lot of eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper strung together only we put a, a half twist in it so that it was continuous so when we got to the first piece again then we stopped but um, yeah. but, but a movie strip <clears throat> it makes things different and, and they're the, the same at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the thing I love about, about the shape is that it has one surface and one edge. Mm -hmm. and it just is amazing. Mind boggling. Yes, <laughs> quite. There's, um, there's a piece in the other room that I think it's worth kind of talking about, which is the egg time event, mm -hmm. which is a block of plaster, and then it just stamped on it, it says, one hen egg, do not open for a hundred years, egg time event, is that the... Yeah, and then... The and there's, so there's a hen egg inside, but you know, it's a block of plaster, but then you know that there's an egg inside, and then it's about preserving it, and it's, it, it really transforms the simplicity of an egg into the simplicity of this block. And it's completely not precious, but it's it's also sort of takes you out of, I mean, it makes you think about all sorts of things about permanence and time and what's going to actually happen inside this block and the ability to preserve things. It's, it's very, very rich, but it, it kind of gets at what you were talking about, sir, with this just well, taking, it's a very simple move on a, on a simple set of objects that well, I kept hearing a about a Chinese food where an egg was become was a hundred years old, mm. and perhaps they aren't always a hundred years old, but they're called hundred-year-old eggs. And I began to think about that and how you could make how you could make one. So I I poured plaster and I put the egg in and then I poured some more plaster. And the first ones I made, I didn't score the plaster so that it would really bond, and some of the eggs exploded. Oh. It was very exciting and it smelled terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you were born, I took a, a card the size of those printed cards there and squared one off and said, new boy event, and put how much you weighed and what date you were born and so forth. <laughs> were you around in Cape Breton when I guess I came across these old hen eggs that had been from Willie Gillis's chickens that had gotten <laughs> laid in this barrel in the barn. Oh my heavens. And they were covered with you know, chicken shit and straw yeah. and everything. Yeah. But they hadn't exploded so I was curious and opened up one and uh, it had transformed into a kind of a nice cheese, uh, you know, it had uh -huh. <laughs> gone through a uh, you know, transformation, and I was thinking that it's very much probably the nature of 100-year-old eggs, and thinking about your well, time I think, event. Well, I think through. when you're making 100-year-old eggs to eat, yep. I think they're put in ash. Ash, ash yeah. Uh -huh. I, I was trying to think of the word, but something similar to plaster, uh -huh. but, lime. Um, lime, lime, that's it, that's, that's is the no, main ingredient of ash. Yeah, yeah. Maybe exactly. that's the process of what you were calling in that poem, deliquesces, like of the egg changing its form. Yeah, Hannah Higgins talks about that in the book. Hmm. Next uh, time. I will get that egg for you. Oh. We can eat them. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Do you do any performances with that as well? 
The one in there is almost 50 years old. With, with, um, do you do any work with Hannah's mother? With Allison? Um, Allison Knowles. Yeah, Allison and I were very good friends, and Hannah Higgins and her twin Jessica were born three weeks after my first child, Tyke, was born. And so they, they, they were fraternal twins, and Tyke looked more like each of them than they looked like each other, and they'd go <laughs> skipping down the, down the street together, and people would think they were triplets. But yeah, we were good friends with Allison and Dick. Did you ever like make a sandwich with her, or do identical lunch stuff? Huh. Yeah, she made a uh, one of her silk screens was uh, my late partner Stephen Barbell and me having an identical lunch sandwich. But what I was thinking but, of was oh. each time I gave birth. What I wanted was a tuna salad sandwich yeah. on Halloween, right. uh -huh. and you would bring it to me, and yeah. that was right. that was what the identical lunch was. It was tuna on um, whole wheat with a cup of soup. Or butternut, or right? Yeah. Or this so this again goes back to the score. This was a, a this was a performance that Allison would do, and she would go to a diner and order the identical lunch, or she would bring other people and they would eat the lunch, and then she would take document too. it with photographs and then make silk screens of it, and so it's this. It's the eating of the lunch is, is the creative process, and then it's all the documentation around it. Yeah. They're quite beautiful prints. Mm -hmm. But this, this wasn't documented. It was yeah. just something sure. that Jeff and yeah. I did when you well, were talking Because the experience is really the experience of eating it that encompasses all the thoughts that you're thinking when you're eating it and everything else. Yeah, right. Right. And then it's gone when it's over. <laughs> like and everything else. And then it's a else. memory. Mm -hmm. And you can write about what you remember thinking when reading the sandwich. And the back to the subversiveness question. I mean, there's no. It's not a. You're not creating valuable relics to sell. You're doing something, and that the doing of it is the. Of course, I guess you make a silk screen too, and then you have that. But mm -hmm. There's something about the not um, intentionally trying to do the creative process without creating material value, just creating direct experience. And I think that's pretty good. Which is yeah. subversive. Subversive, or in this case, culture. maybe it's exposing the subversion of the materiality of This was a very life. important part of Fluxus, was subverting the dominant paradigm, if you will. Right. So I, I have to tell you, I, I was at a Fluxus event I believe it was in like 1967. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? 66? Sure. Yeah. And it, it was at the Armory, some Armory. Oh, yeah, the, the, the Avant Garde Festival at the Armory? I think it was the Avant Garde Festival. I just Festival. remember this one event. Mm -hmm. And there was a ladder in a light bulb and bomb. <laughs> but I think yeah, I have the. Is that Yoko's piece where you go up the ladder and you look in? I think Rauschenberg, or is that possible? Rauschenberg was. Oh, part well, of it? there were um, there were nine evenings of events that Rauschenberg and Cunningham and a group of others were involved with. And uh, I guess this was in the armory. And, uh, it was a series of performance. They had bleachers along the side, and the performances right. took place over a number of days. Okay. I went to a group of them. Uh, John Cage did one where he had all this electronic wiring and speakers, and uh, worked with the switches and so forth to build up <coughs> the maximum amount of white noise and so forth, filling the space. And it wow. got louder and louder and louder. And you would see the, the audience in the bleachers either quietly fled with their hands <laughs> over their ears or moved in closer to be totally enveloped and then close to the source. And it was really wonderful to see this you know, separation of the sheep and goats or whatever. Right. You know, but, uh, you know, I, I and, don't remember being you know, there. Yeah, you may not. We, I, I was there, but yeah. I, we may not have gone together. But uh, that pre, I don't know, maybe it was the beginning, just one of the series of events. I remember Rauschenberg doing 
one of them, what was it, when mattresses, maybe Von Rainer was working with mattresses, mm -hmm. and uh, things were taking place in the balconies above and so forth. They're very exciting. The combines. Yeah. What? The combines. Yeah. The mattresses. Combines. The combines. Yeah, well, that was a term that he used for some of his words. I think he paired himself with Billy Kluver from Bell Labs. Yeah, yeah. and I think Billy was Billy Kluver was the one who was doing all the troubleshooting in terms of electronics and computers and technology there. There's this Experiments in Art and Technology, EAT, and uh, strong collaboration of artists and scientists. I remember not very much about the event, except I remember being very excited about it. You know, it was just, yeah, yeah. It was exciting. New York was quite something in those days. It may still be, but I'm not there, so I don't know. Radical is exciting now. There you go. That's right. The new New York. I'm amused that your pages at the end with the poem about Alaska, the, the wonderful statement you have on Guantanamo. Louder. Yeah. The wonderful yeah. statement on Guantanamo is very well written. And then the toilet chair, and then your collection of poems, because <laughs> there's a coming together. In 1948, I was working in a Central Alaska, and I was given the occipital lobe of a hairy mammoth, <laughs> which was about this big. And we took I, it, I took it back to Massachusetts, where we used it as a toilet seat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, when exam eventually we closed the 200-year-old farmhouse and sold it, and I had things to give away. The Berkshire Museum in Pittsfield has an extraordinary collection of found objects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I donated many objects to them. Mm. <laughs> including that. Including the, the mammoth. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I grew up sitting on a whale vertebra. Oh. Uh -huh. I had whalers in my ancestry. And somehow or other, one came down to our family. And it made a very nice sort of a a kid-sized stool to sit on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, well, yeah. I, how did you get the idea for the calligraphy? Your calligraphy pictures. I was curious where all the, the stenciled letters are kind of. Well, I married into a family all of whom knew how to do um, <laughs> beautiful italic writing, uh, calligraphic writing, and I didn't know how to do that. And I kind of got into stencils and I said, okay, that's a calligraphy too. So it's, that's just a matter of me naming it calligraphy. Um, and, but all, all, all that means is beautiful writing anyway. And um, so I but I think it's playing as usual. If you use the stencil that has the empty space as opposed to, oh, here you filled it in, as opposed to a rubber stamp or something that's filled right. in space that has a positive space and stuff. Yeah, you could do that too, but it wasn't what I chose to do. Right, exactly. No, I think it's that I was saying that I thought the choice was really interesting. It kind of leaves a kind of openness and creates more about shape than the actual words, but there's words there and you're going back and forth. So um, I wanted to talk about the, the little uh, group of four figures. Oh, this thing here? Yeah, from the, from the soup bowl, as usual. Um, I was the youngest of four daughters, and every now and then we got lined up for a picture. And um, these actually kind of looked like the four of us. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and yet there, there was something grotesque about them, so I called them trolls. But um, it definitely, in my mind, has the resonance of a family photograph. Mm -hmm. And those are bones from oxtail soup? Yeah. Or? The first one is the one that's up there. Oh, on the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were three mm -hmm. sizes of bones, and I was playing with them. and. Um, and I realized it was like a daddy and a mummy and a little one. Mm -hmm. And mostly they're not cut in the back, but these ones had been cut by the butcher. So it was easy to mount on a board. And uh, I call it bison family singing, because <laughs> their mouths are open. Mm -hmm. And um, just, you know, it's just fun to, to play like that. I said playing with your food. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that there behind you is is um, is it a That's presentation? Is it a Native American uh, tribal ceremony for a newborn, or is it a Christian nativity scene <laughs> with one wise man and three shepherds and and so on? And you know. It, those are the two things that occurred to me, but something else might occur to somebody else. And there's one around the corner, right? The says introducing that one on, on, on the shelves. In the the keys to the truck. No, it was something about introducing a new member of, was that? No, that's this one. That's this one? This one is um, one oh. of the keys to the truck. Oh, okay. It, it looked like one of the people have their arms open for, to meet this new, the new member of the community. Well, there you go <laughs> with your association. Um, one, of, one of them is a scene from Hamlet, and another is um, sled dogs mushing in the Yukon. And, you know, that, that's what occurred to me. That doesn't mean it's definitive. What are you sitting on behind you? What is that? Oh, I'll get off it. <laughs> this is... No, the light smoking. Oh. oh, well, the chair is also... The chair is a piece, too, and I'll, I'll explain oh, that it, there's a series of ten chairs, and this is the tenth one, which is... Um, there were t there were two yeah. series, and, and the second <clears throat> series was called The Bush Years, and this one is called Guantanamo, or Gitmo, Oh, and when you lift this up there. and look in, you're looking into a bedpan full of barbed wire and seeing your own face in a mirror. <laughs> so you are there. Yeah, that's what I saw in the book. But the, the light yeah, these, these are just, um, it, was, it was a commercial advertising medium and I decided I could put poems or short you uh, did it. things on it. Yeah. My father had the patent for that. And the Depression went bankrupt and had to sell it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Salescaster was the company that yeah. made it. Huh. It's interesting too because now with the LED lighting and the, the, these sort of visual scrolling things are just kind of they're just everywhere, but it was like, it was this moment when you had to go and build an actual machine to do it, and it's... But it was mechanical. Yeah. 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 And, and she went and went to find the commercial, the shop the down that, that, that actually them. produced them and, and, and commissioned it with poems and said it, yeah. You have to change belts. Each you belt is on a poem. You can put a haiku on it, or you can, if you really squeeze, you can get a quatrain in. Turning my chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to try to the company. It's so like a baby's chair. It's a comfortable chair. And I think we went back. It's a pretty good chair. It's a pretty nice chair. It's a pretty nice chair. It's a pretty nice chair
us. Mm -hmm. We try to contact the company so we can get more because we have these so interchangeable maybe bands. Maybe if everyone wants to just look around at the artwork. Well, maybe you have its own bands. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, thanks a lot for participating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Don. There's 10 of these chairs, and we don't have the space to do all of them in here, obviously. Yeah, it's a Otherwise, there would be room to, I mean, there would literally be, probably could put all 10 chairs in here, then there would be no room to walk around. So instead, what we came up with, with these 10 stations with the color photographs, and Sai has come up with this amazing way of, the, the, they're kind of like shimmering off the, like hovering away from the wall. So you can just see the chairs in the order that um, Nye came up with them, one through ten. And there's a, there's a short piece about all the chairs at the end of number ten. But, he, but these chairs are like really wonderful to see together. And, um, and one, we, of, one of them is expanded, and that's the one in the front window. Right, right. There are, we do have some that's of the chairs That's the one about today. the environment. Yes, we have the one that um, Hilda Marie is sitting in, and we have the one in the front window, which is about the environment, which is now taken on this wonderful tableau. And then over here we have the chair called Sanctity, which is the high chair rigged to look like a sort of electric chair. And there's a little article you can read about in the book about that. And there's two chairs in the small gallery room. One is We the People, which has copies of the Constitution embossed or in our paper machine collaged. collaged onto the chair. And the other one is about the Chads, about the 2004 election. That's one of my favorites. It says vote, and then there's, it's like a bedpan with the Chads, and the roll of toilet paper that says vote on. It's really amazing. So it's ballot. 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 Yeah, it's really amazing. And so there, and there's a variety of them. Um, there's going to be a couple of the chairs shown at Putney School also. Mm -hmm. I think chair number one and three will be there. But we hope to find other places to show not only the chairs, but this show could be a traveling ex exhibit if anybody uh, has any ideas or if you learn of anybody who's interested. It's an election year and I would like to have more people see it. Yeah. It's a wonderful show and I hope it has more venues and a beautiful catalog and I hope that it's wide circulation. And my Thanks, Jeff. Hats off to you guys. It's great. Yeah. And great to be here. Thank you. And Sir Rodney Sir, who is a very dear friend, made a whole box full of beautiful cards of the U.S. Uber Alice piece and uh, postcards, and they are free and help yourself. Oh, honey, you've got pictures on the wall. I didn't know that. Is this such a Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah.